Hi, welcome to lab. This is bone tissue and axial skeleton. Um, pretty straightforward lab this week, um, but just a, a lot of information. So it's, it's mostly anatomy. Um, if you click here, that will be your lab guide, which should look like this. Well, and I'm going to leave the screen, the recording window big like this, because I'm going to be toggling back and forth between different screens. Um, so that's what your, this is what your lab guide should look like, sorry. And then if you click here, it takes you to the lab report page. And if you click there, your lab report should look like this, pretty similar format to your other lab reports and lab guides. Um, so what I am going to do is walk you through the lab report, or excuse me, walk you through the lab guide and refer back to the lab report. Looking at your objectives, there are a couple that are really not that important. Uh, we're not doing classifying different types of bones. That's not even in the guide anywhere. So don't worry about that. That's like long bones, short bones, irregular bones. Um, we are going to do the parts of an osteon, chemical composition of bone, the microscope slide, and then the axial skeleton. I'm going to start small, and by small I mean at the chemical level of structure. What is bone made out of? Uh, bone is a connective tissue, so it's cells suspended in an extracellular matrix. When we talk about the composition of bone here, we're really referring to what is in the extracellular matrix. And if you recall from the tissues chapter, the extracellular matrix is usually composed of some protein fibers and ground substance. So with bone, the protein fibers are collagen fibers. Um, collagen, you want to know, is organic. And so when we talk about the ground substance of bone, sometimes we talk about the organic part and the inorganic part. Organic in this case just means carbon containing. And collagen, because it's made out of amino acids which have carbon in them, qualifies as organic. Um, then the ground substance is salt crystals. What you want to focus on is calcium. Um, so the most of what makes your bone hard is calcium, and it comes in different forms, calcium phosphate or and calcium carbonate. Um, this we refer to as the inorganic portion, even though there is some carbon in the carbonate because it is based on calcium, it is largely inorganic. All right, so you've got your collagen and your salt crystals. Um, your bones, because they have to hold you up, need to be hard. They need to have weight-bearing strength. Um, but they also need to be somewhat flexible so that they don't snap too much. So you can almost think of your bones as like if you've ever seen the pillars for a big concrete bridge being poured. They have the metal rebar in the casings before they pour all the concrete. Uh, so the collagen fibers act like rebar and they reinforce the salt crystals and make them less brittle so that bones aren't going to snap right in the middle. And then the salt crystals make your bones hard and able to bear weight. Now, in your lab report, um, I tell you to watch this video and then answer these questions. Um, so they are going to treat the bones two different ways. Um, one of the treatments is going to destroy or dissolve the mineral portion. The other will destroy or dissolve the collagen. That will then affect the structural integrity or the mechanical properties of the bone. Um, the video is like three minutes, so watch the video and answer the questions. And then I'm not going to make you dissolve your own chicken bone in vinegar because it takes like a week and it's just busy work and not worth it. Um, so that's chemical composition of bone. Watch the video, know the questions. Then what do we do? We are going to go up to sort of this level of structure and look at the microscopic structure of bone. Um, there are two different textures or kinds of bone. So if you look at this bone right here, 
um, the shaft, if you cut it in cross section, looks solid, like you don't see any holes in it. But the ends are somewhat spongy. They look like a sponge when you cut them in half. These are the two different forms or texture of bone. Here you can see a little bit of spongy bone in the middle. We want to focus on the microscopic structure of the compact portion of the bone. So if you cut the shaft of a bone in cross section, or this is a longitudinal section, and looked at it under the microscope, it might look like this, or if I scroll down, right, this picture right here. Um, and this is one of the few times where the microscope part is easy. Um, pretty much any slide of bone that is treated the way this slide has been treated will look like this. Um, so if you see this picture, just know that this is what bone looks like under the microscope. Um, and then, well, sorry, let me go back down here. So this right here is one osteon. This is another osteon. The center of each osteon is called the central canal. So if we go up here, the compact bone you can see is made out of many different osteons. What you need to know is this list of structures here, with the exception of the perforating canal or Volksmann's canal, we're not going to worry about that one. Um, that is these kinds of canals here, which run from the outside of the bone to the inside of the bone. We want to focus on the little hole in the middle of each osteon called the central canal. Um, so this is a picture that I stole because the picture in our free book um, is about worth what we paid for it. Um, so this is a picture of a model osteon. We have one in our lab very similar to it, pretty much the same thing. So this is just one of these here, um, or this is supposed to represent one of these here, just to give you some perspective. Um, so in the middle is the central canal. And then the central canal is surrounded by layers of bone called lamella. Because these are all one inside of another, the layers that make up the osteon are called concentric lamella. Um, you don't need to know it, but these other layers out here that don't wrap around are called circumferential lamella. Um, so in between the lamella, are these little holes here. They are called lacuna. One is a lacuna, multiple is lacunae. Inside of those little holes live cells called osteocytes. So the osteocyte is the cell that lives in the lacuna. Then if you look here, you can see what looks like little cracks or like spider, spider legs or something. Those are little canals that are etched in the calcium phosphate matrix called cannuliculi. So here they just look like texture. Here they're painted red. The red is supposed to be the cytoplasm of the osteocyte and the blue would be the nucleus. So the body of the osteocyte where the nucleus is is contained within the lacuna and then streams of cytoplasm run through the cannuliculi so that the osteocytes can communicate with each other. So if you look here, this osteocyte can touch that osteocyte and this one can touch that one. And then on the side, if you strip away the lamella, you can see what the lacuna look like from a different perspective. And you can also see that there are cannuliculi that would connect this osteocyte to that one and that one to this one. So the osteocytes actually form a network and are able to communicate with one another. Um, the current hypothesis or theory about what they do is they're actually communicating information about stress, but that I don't know if we know that is um, scientific consensus yet. So then we want to know 
this anatomy on this model or this figure. And then we want to be able to recognize this as bone tissue. Then we go up one more level of structure and just look at what a typical long bone might look like. Now, you have, or there is, right here, um, four items that you need to be able to identify on a typical long bone. Uh, the picture of the long bone is down here. Um, so a long bone is just described as anything that is longer than it is wide. Um, so it's about the ratio, not necessarily whether it is definitively long or not. So this is a femur. It is obviously long, but even the bones in your fingers qualify as long bones because they are sort of rectangular in shape and they have the same basic features that this femur has. Um, so the long shaft of a long bone is called the diaphysis. Either end is called an epiphysis. You need to know that the diaphysis is composed of compact bone and the two epiphyses are made out of spongy bone. In addition, you want to know that the spongy bone contains red marrow. And then within the diaphysis, the shaft is actually somewhat hollow in that it's not solid bone. Um, so this hollow portion is called the medullary cavity. That is filled with yellow bone marrow. Uh, we will go over the difference between the two in a lecture. For now, I will just say that yellow marrow is mostly lipid and red marrow is the bone marrow that you hear about if somebody gets a bone marrow transplant. This is where all of your blood cells are born. Red blood cells and white blood cells are all born in the red marrow. So this then brings us back to our lab report. Um, so activity one was just answering these questions. Activity two, you are going to pick a long bone on your skeleton and then label what does it say here? Label the uh, epiphysis and the diaphysis and then cut out a piece of paper to approximate where the medullary cavity would be. My version of this looks like this here. I think it all fits in the screen there. Um, so this is the femur. There's my two epiphyses, my diaphysis. Um, and then I cut out something to look somewhat like the medullary cavity. It took me all of eight minutes, maybe more. Um, so that shouldn't be bad. Uh, so do that, take a picture of that, plunk that right in here. And then we get to really the heart of the lab or where most of the information is, is now we're just continuing through your lab guide to the axial skeleton. Um, let me just scroll down. So what you first thing, sorry, I'm stuttering. It's, it's, uh, surprisingly hard to deliver a smooth presentation when you know you're being recorded. Uh, first thing you want to know is just what the heck is the axial skeleton? Um, it is everything that is this color here, whatever this grayish, not this green color is. So it's your skull, your vertebral column, the sacrum and coccyx at the end of your vertebral column, your uh, sternum, and your rib cage. So these are the parts of the skeleton that we're learning this week. So first up is the parts of the skull. You have many pictures of the skull to study and guide you through it. Um, these would be the kinds of pictures that might show up on your lab quiz. This is your list of things to know on the skull. Um, so all of these bones, uh, these parts of bones, like the foramen magnum, the occipital condyles, and all of these sutures, you want to know. For your lab guide, excuse me, for your lab report, um, I have most of the same things here listed for you to identify. And I cut it up into a couple of different parts. Um, so there's the parts of the skull label, all the parts of the skull that are not double crossed off here. Um, take a couple of pictures of the skull, don't go crazy. Um, 
and then paste those pictures in here. And I think we'll do the rest of this when we get to the rest of this. Um, so I am not going to walk you through all of this stuff um, because it's, I don't know how to teach anatomy through a computer. And really it's just stuff that you need to learn by looking at it and practicing it. Um, I will point out if there are any tricky parts. Um, and let me just scroll through this in my head. Um, all of this is relatively straightforward. It's just parts and parts and parts. Um, don't worry about the function of any of these bones or the description of 1 through 13 here. Just be able to identify them when you see them. With the foramen magnum and the occipital condyles, these are kind of special parts of the skull, so you do want to know what they do. Um, and we haven't gone over what a foramen is yet, or a condyle, so it's not going to make a lot of sense. Um, a foramen, I will just say, is a hole in, the hole in a bone. Magnum means big, so foramen magnum just means big hole. And condyles are surfaces where two bones form a joint or articulate with one another. Um, and occipital just means it's part of the occipital bone. So these are the two places where the base of your skull sits on top of your first um, vertebrae called the atlas. So you want to know those two functions. Then when it comes to the sutures, um, sutures are just parts where two bones meet. So if we go up here, this is your occipital bone, this is your parietal bone. For reasons that I don't understand, the suture between the two of them is called the lambdoid suture. So you want to be able to identify these five sutures when you see them, either on a picture of a regular skull model or these pictures here. And then there are sometimes follow-up questions, depending on the form of the exam, about what two bones the suture holds together. That's relatively straightforward. If you know the names of all of the bones and you know the names of the sutures, then it's easy to say this is the sagittal suture and it holds together your two parietal bones because you already know what the names of the bones are. So at this point, I should point out um, that this would be where you might want to go to practice anatomy lab. This is going to be your friend for the skeleton. So if you click on Practice Anatomy Lab, and whoops, I've got it open already. Um, well, let me just walk you through it real quick, right? So you click on it, you launch it, and then it's got, you're going to want the anatomical models. Click on that. And then there's axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton. Open the axial skeleton, and there's separate presentations for the skull, the vertebral column, and your thoracic cage. Um, so if you look at the skull, you've got 35 images of real human skulls, again, with labels, without labels. Um, some of them you can rotate, which is kind of cool, but you can't rotate all of them. Um, so that's just fun if you want to play with that. Um, but we're, you know, work your way through this. It's got many different views of all the bones. You know how it works. You can hover over it. You can give yourself a quiz. You can give yourself a lab practical. The other thing I wanted to point out is, let me launch the study area again. In addition to just regular old practice anatomy lab, you can have Practice Anatomy Lab make flashcards for you. Um, so let me move this over. Can I? There we go. Um, right, so here's Practice Anatomy Lab flashcards. You're going to want to say, I'm doing some models, submit. Um, I'm doing the axial skeleton and you scroll down here. You can't see it, but there's a submit button down there. Submit. Um, then you can scroll through this very long list um, and 
put down or click on everything that's on your list and then hit review. And oh, sorry, my computer may be freezing up on me. I don't know. Oh, no, it's not. Okay. Pardon me. Um, so at any, way, any rate, let me go back. Um, you hit review. These flashcards pop up. Um, and it highlights the structure and then you flip it over and it gives you the name of the structure and um, it just walks you through a whole bunch of different stuff. I don't even remember which structures I picked. Um, that looks like, oh, the styloid process? Uh, styloid mastoid foramen. I was wrong. Difficult picture. Um, so you can make um, digital flashcards there. And I also put a link to a folder here, hopefully this will work for you, um, that should take you to this Dropbox folder. And then all of these images are in there. I just plopped the whole folder into Dropbox. So these are your images from the lab guide without all of the labels on them. You can print out the images that you think will be handy and make flashcards out of them. I just thought I should give you something that you can work with if you want to study pictures in your hands and not images on a screen. Um, so that is there for you. Okay, so let's go back to our lab guide. Sorry, I'm kind of jumping around here. Um, we're, we were on our lab guide. Uh, vertebral column. So first thing you want to know is that this is what it looks like. I'll just give you the quick overview first. Um, you have in your neck seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae. These are all defined as the ribs that are, excuse me, the vertebrae that are attached to ribs. And then below that are five lumbar vertebrae, your sacrum, and then your coccyx. If we look at the lab report, um, this is what you're identifying on the vertebral column for your lab report. Sacrum, coccyx, um, and if you can get the intervertebral foramen, I'll point that out later as well as the intervertebral discs. Um, and then the cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, and lumbar vertebrae, you can just do like one long piece of tape or paper and label them each as a group. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, all right, so um, there's a lot more that you need to know that you're not going to put in your lab report because it would just be silly to have you do that much. Um, but on any generic vertebrae like this one right here, you want to be able to identify these parts here. So body, spinous process, vertebral foramen, transverse process, and the superior and inferior articular processes. So all of that can be seen on this sort of generic looking vertebrae here. Um, the body is how the vertebrae stack on top of one another. Sticking out to either side is the transverse process. Sticking out the back is the spinous process. The hole in the middle is called the vertebral foramen. That is where you find the spinal cord. And then when you stack two vertebrae on top of each other, there's a little hole in between the two vertebrae. That is the intervertebral foramen. So you can only see that on, you'll see it on your intact skeleton and mostly from the side. It doesn't show up well in any of the pictures. Um, sorry, I'm moving quickly. So on any regular vertebrae, those five things. Oops, sorry, I just jumped around again. I'm pausing and re-recording parts of it because I keep on stumbling over things. Uh, so we said be able to identify those five things. And if you look, they're repeated here and here. So it looks like a lot, but it's not. No. Then you need to be able to identify C1 or C2, your first cervical vertebrae, or your second cervical vertebrae when you see them, or any of the other five cervical vertebrae, um, be able to say whether it's a cervical vertebrae, a thoracic vertebrae, or a lumbar vertebrae. 
So it's first being able to differentiate cervical, thoracic versus lumbar. And if you determine you have a cervical vertebrae, say whether it's the atlas, the axis, or one of the other five remaining cervical vertebrae. This sounds hard. It is not. Um, so if you scroll back up, there are lots of pictures to help you out. Um, this is the first one. This is what your atlas looks like. This is what your atlas looks like. Um, in a few minutes, I'll also show you the pictures in Practice Anatomy Lab, but I'm going to go through what's in your lab guide first. What you want to pay attention to for the atlas is this part right here. So you will notice it is relatively thin. And this thing here called the dens, that's actually attached to your axis. So if you imagine that dens not being there, that part that's labeled anterior arch would be relatively thin. So there is no body on the atlas like there is on the axis. So this part down here, if you look at it from underneath, looks thicker, um, closer to this body here. Um, so if it doesn't have a body, it's the atlas. If it has this little thing sticking up, it is the axis. Only the axis has this weird little nub sticking up called the dens, which makes it relatively easy to identify. Then you need to be able to figure out what your other five cervical vertebrae look like versus a thoracic or a lumbar vertebrae. Um, first up, I'm going to use this right here. This says typical cervical vertebrae. You will notice that it's got a hole here and a hole there. Those are called transverse foramen. All of your cervical vertebrae and only your cervical vertebrae have transverse foramen. So if you see those two additional holes, you know it's cervical, then you just need to figure out whether it's C1, C2, or somewhere between C3 and C7. So they're really easy to spot. You just look for the transverse foramen. Um, this is a thoracic vertebrae. Here's the transverse process on a thoracic vertebrae. There is no third hole. Um, so if it doesn't have a third hole, it's either thoracic or lumbar. Um, thoracic vertebrae, we don't have, I don't have the great picture I'm looking for. Um, so we'll go over it here, but we'll also go over it in practice anatomy lab. A couple of things that you can see in the pictures in your lab guide. For thoracic vertebrae, the body is kind of triangular in shape, um, a little bit smaller than the lumbar vertebrae, which you'll see, and the vertebral foramen is circular. For lumbar vertebrae, you've got more of a triangular vertebral foramen, a bigger body, which is more kidney bean shaped. So then practice anatomy lab, if we go back to that, and I, I already had this stuff open, so let me just show you, right? If you're in practice anatomy lab and, whoops, right, anatomical models, axial skeleton, vertebral column, you've got all of these images. So clicking through, it's got your atlas. Um, I will let you scroll through the pictures and highlight things in blue. Um, I, I think once I start trying to point stuff out on this, it gets distracting because the blue keeps jumping around. Um, so just be aware that there's a couple of pictures of the atlas. Uh, so it's the superior view of the atlas, the inferior view of the atlas. Um, so this is looking up at it from underneath it. And then there's your axis. That's the dens right there. It doesn't show up very well because they don't give you a picture from the side where you could see it sticking up from the top. But it does have atlas and axis, axis from the bottom. And then your typical cervical vertebrae, you'll notice it's got um, the transverse foramen and, well actually that's all you need to look for is the transverse foramen. And then when you go to, let me get thoracic, um, thoracic from the top, kind of a pointy front on the body here, 
and definitely a circular vertebral foramen, that thing there. Then when you look at it from the side, um, this is probably the view I would try and get for you on a quiz or an exam, because you can see how long and pointy the spinous process is. That's a big thing to look for for cervical vertebrae. Then if we skip to, excuse me, not cervical, thoracic. This is thoracic. This is what thoracic looks like. I misspeak quite often. It's a problem. Uh, then lumbar. Again, lumbar from the top. You've got the kidney bean shaped body and more of a triangular vertebral foramen. If you look at lumbar from the side, now you've got a much blunter spinous process pointing out towards the back. So if you can tell the difference between this and this, you can tell the difference between lumbar and thoracic. And if you can count to three, right, then you can identify a cervical vertebrae because it's got one, two, three holes. This one has these extra ones there. I didn't even know they existed. Um, but just worry about those two additional transverse foramen. Uh, so that is, let's go back to the lab guide. Um, all of this. So your five parts of a generic vertebrae, atlas, axis, and then is it cervical, is it thoracic, is it lumbar? Um, for sacrum and coccyx, you're just identifying them, the sacrum or the coccyx. It's pretty straightforward. And then for the thoracic cage, I'm making it even more simple. Um, where's the stuff you're supposed to know? So they've got, oh, we did make it simple. Oh, this is great. Um, I forgot that we simplified the lab guides. So this is it. Be able to identify the sternum, the manubrium, the body, the xiphoid process, and the ribs. So if we go up here, if you see this, say it's the sternum, manubrium, body, xiphoid process, and these are ribs. Don't worry about how many there are, whether they're floating or attached, true or false ribs. Just be able to identify ribs. Um, and then for the fetal skeleton, um, we will cover this. It's relatively straightforward. Um, we have not talked about how bones are formed yet. Uh, but the bones of your skull are formed by a process called intramembranous ossification. So all of this, all of the flat parts of your skull, start out as mesenchyme, just boring sheets of mesenchyme. Remember that um, embryonic tissue source that all of your connective tissues develop from or are derived from. When a bone starts to form in mesenchyme, it happens right in the middle of what is going to be the bone. So this is the first part of the mesenchyme that starts to turn into bone, and then it hardens like ripples spreading across a pond. But where it starts is called the ossification center. On a fetal skull, they're a little bit pointy. So if you look right there, there's kind of a little bit of a point or a corner right there. That's an ossification center. It's a lot easier to see on an actual baby skull, but there are four of them, uh, two on the two frontal bones and one little pointy spot on either, ox uh, excuse me, on either parietal bone. Um, then where the mesenchyme hasn't fully ossified yet, where it hasn't hardened and turned into bone, is what you usually call the soft spot. Um, in anatomy and physiology, we call it a fontanelle. So for, if you see a picture of the fetal skull, be able to identify the ossification centers and the fontanelles. That is everything you need to know. There is no lab report activity for the fetal skull because you don't have anything to work with. It's just these things to label. Um, I hope this is helpful. I know it is a lot of information. Um, and I encourage you to find a way to study that involves like flashcards or some sort of repetition because there's really 
there's no shortcut to learning anatomy. You just have to point at it and say it and write it a million times. And here is, I'm sorry I'm going on, one last piece of very important information. If you want to be able to type or write something, you need to be able to say it. So if you cannot bring yourself to say occipitomastoid, you will not be able to spell occipitomastoid. Um, so practice trying to say these things, even if you're not sure how to pronounce them. Um, if whatever comes out of your mouth sounds to you like what's on the page, you'll be able to produce what's on the page based on whatever phonetic information you have stored in your head. Um, so you just have to practice this stuff. Say it, write it, repeatedly practice identifying it, and give yourself the opportunity to identify this stuff or to practice it when there aren't any labels. If you just keep rereading, let me go back, right, your lab report, and you go, oh, that's frontal, that's an ossification center, you're going to think you know it because the labels are there. But this is why I gave you the blank images here so that you can present yourself with a blank image and have to pull the name from memory. You don't want the first time you see the blank image to be on a quiz or an exam. All right, that's it. Everything you need to know. Um, Send me messages if there are questions because I know that there's a lot of information in this lab. Good luck.